All right, folks. So we're here again. Same day, different topic. Today we're talking about civil rights. And we're going to break our civil rights lecture into two screencasts. I thought it was important for not only for my own sake, so I can handle the content, make sure that you're getting it, but for you, because it is kind of uh, difficult material. So today's screencast is going to focus on civil rights. What do we mean when we talk about civil rights? And on two different types of, recognize that there's two types of discrimination. And also, probably the more difficult is understand the legal classifications and the standard of review that the court applies when determining uh, whether the government can legally discriminate on the basis of age race, sex, gender, sexual orientation. Those are difficult questions, so let's get down to it. Civil rights. All right, so the first thing we want to kind of go back to where we started with and just recognize that there is a difference between civil rights and civil liberties. If you take away the word civil and just talk about rights and liberties, there's really no difference, especially to the layperson on the street. But for those of us that are political scientists, we do have to recognize that there's a difference. So we split chapter five really focusing in on civil liberties. And civil liberties concerns your basic rights and freedoms that are guaranteed, whether it is the Bill of Rights that guarantees them or other aspects and parts of the Constitution. Or maybe it's a constructed right, like the right to privacy that has been constructed by the courts over time. Just with civil liberties, we're really focusing on the due process clauses, of the 5th and 14th Amendment, that there's a process government has to go through if they want to take your life, liberty, or your property. And uh, recognizing that it also is limiting the power of government. So with civil liberties, we talk about governmental power decreasing. And because it's decreasing, we're putting limits on governmental power. We need to recognize that we connect civil liberties to the constitutional principle limited government. Now, with Chapter 6, we're kind of uh, flipping the coin. We're looking at civil rights. And with civil rights, we're looking at your citizenship rights, your voting rights, uh, and how they were extended to different groups of people with the 15th, the 19th, and the 26th Amendment. Okay, But we also are looking at your basic right for to be treated equally under the law. So it's a, another clause within the 14th Amendment. Okay, and because we're extending the protections, that we're extending equal treatment to more and more groups of people, we're extending citizenship rights to more and more groups of people, we're essentially increasing the power of government to make sure that those rights, those citizenship rights are protected. And because we are redefining the ideal that was stated in the Declaration of Independence, or sorry, with the there's one ideal that's in the Declaration of Independence, all men that are created equal, but also the idea in the preamble to the Constitution where it says, we the people, and we're redefining who the people are. So in that case, we connect civil rights to the constitutional principle of popular sovereignty. Even though we're increasing the power of government, we're increasing the power of government to ensure that the people is a broader and broader category and they're treated equally under the law. So that's kind of where we will be begin with, just noting the difference between civil rights and civil liberties. Now, two types of discrimination that you have to be aware of. There is de jure discrimination, which is discrimination by law, law lawfully authorized discrimination. We generally associate de jure discrimination with the South. However, legal discrimination occurs today and it's all it's all over the place, you know, both at the state level and the national level happens all the time. Uh, one example of de jure discrimination are the black codes. So after the passage of the 13th Amendment that banned slavery and freed the slaves across the country, uh, there were attempts by southern legislatures to um, use their state legislatures to basically subordinate African-Americans to an inferior class of people. So they were law, they passed laws that treated people differently on the basis of their race. And those were black codes. Now, de facto discrimination is not lawfully authorized. It's discrimination that's the result of custom. There's a result of tradition. 
And we associate uh, de facto discrimination, discrimination in fact, um, more with the North, okay, the Northern part of the United States. Now, a little bit about combating discrimination. So de jure discrimination is not easier to combat, but it is simpler to combat. When you have a substantive law that is treating differently people differently on the basis of race, the way you combat it is you get rid of the law. So you seek changes to the law. You have lawsuits in the court. And uh, if the, if you need, and sometimes you might use other tactics. So you, you like with the president goes in, going public, you as the people might go public yourself. You might engage in civil disobedience actions, such as boycotts, sit-ins, to get the people to see the unjust nature of a substantive law that's based in de jure discrimination. So then they would advocate also for a change in the laws. Now, de facto discrimination, unfortunately, is much more difficult to combat because people will argue that it's not discrimination. When you have to change people's attitudes, beliefs, and values, it becomes difficult, especially if they don't willingly do so. So if your tactic is to make new laws that may, you know, that let's say that make it a law to value a certain thing or to believe a certain way, think quadrant two in the political spectrum, but also people are going to argue that the solution itself, the resolution, the new law is discriminatory. Okay, so some as things that have happened that we've used to combat de facto discrimination are quotas, school busing, affirmative action. And some of those quotas have, the courts have found were discrimination in itself and have ruled those to be unconstitutional, as you will see. All right, so de jure, a little uh, simpler to combat, just change the laws, de facto much more complex. You have to change people's attitudes, beliefs, and values. All right, so now before we can talk about the complexity of the 14th Amendment, we have to know where this started. And we have to go all the way back to the Dred Scott court case. So the case itself is um, Scott versus Sanford. And Dred Scott was a slave that was living in Missouri and actually spent some time in the free territories, even up was up here in, in the Minneapolis area in Minnesota. And upon returning to Missouri, Scott sued in Missouri court, in state court, you know, that his residency in a free territory made him a free man. He lost in state court, so he sued in federal court. So he got all the way to the Supreme Court, and the question before the Supreme Court was, Dred Scott free or was he a slave? Now, when we talk about Supreme Court cases and low points in history, this is the lowest point in Supreme Court history because the Supreme Court ignored the question. And instead, they came out with a, an opinion that said this, a Negro whose ancestors were imported and sold as slaves, whether enslaved or free, cannot be an American citizen and did, therefore did not have standing to sue in federal court. So the Dred Scott decision basically said that if you were black living in America, whether you were a slave or free, you could not be a citizen of the United States. And because you are not a citizen, you could not use the courts to seek redress. So they never ruled on it. They just said, you're not a citizen. You can't use the courts. Okay. So when we get to the 14th Amendment, one of the first things the 14th Amendment is, does is address the Dred Scott decision. So the first section of the 14th Amendment we call the Citizenship Clause. And it says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and citizens of the state in which you reside. So you have both, you have dual citizenship at the national level and at the state level, okay? And that's gonna be true for all people. Then the Due Process Clause we've talked about because it, the due process clause where it says, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, gave us the language by which we can incorporate the Bill of Rights, you know, against state government intrusions to provide protections from the state government so they couldn't violate your rights, your civil liberties, as we discussed earlier. But today, when we're talking about civil rights, the clause we want to focus on is the Equal Protection Clause, where it says no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of laws. 
because this is the beauty of the 14th Amendment. This is where we see, you know, the ideals of the Declaration of Independence, where they talk about all men created equal. This is where we see that language being embedded into the Constitution. And it's not just men. We see it transforming into all people are created equal. And here's where it happens right here. You can't underestimate the importance of the 14th Amendment and its use today. Okay. All right. Now, before we get too far down that road, though, you should understand that the Equal Protection Clause does not ensure protection against government discrimination in all instances. Just remember, discrimination itself just means that we're treating you differently on the basis of a protected class you happen to be a member of. So we're going to treat you differently on the basis of your age or on the basis of your gender or on the basis of your race or religion. OK, in some instances, those there can be legal discrimination. The example here is income tax. So we're going to treat you differently. Government treats you differently on the basis of your wealth. The wealthy pay a higher percentage in income tax than the poor do. And it's legal discrimination. OK, also, the Equal Protection Clause applies to actions taken by government to treat you differently because of your membership in a protected class. So you need to know what the protected classes are. And finally, because of federalism and that system that we live in, states can provide more protections. They can't take away any protections, but they can provide more. All right, moving on to the, you might want to take a drink of water. Here we go. All right, so you might remember this pyramid. We talked about this when we talked about federalism. Okay, so constitutionally, five protected classes. You got religion, race, color, sex, and national origin. And then, as you will see with the Civil Rights Act in 1964, the na national law, they, we added six more protected classes. So if government wants to treat you differently on the, ba on, on the basis of your membership in any of those 11 classes, there's a process, there's an argument that they have to go through. Now in Minnesota, we can add to that. So in Minnesota, there's 13 protected classes. If Minnesota, so Minnesota has difficulty treating you differently on the basis of your human rights activity or whether or not you happen to be in need of public assistance, okay? It's hard to do because that's government. So this is the big question for today. This is gonna be the ones the most difficult to understand. When can government treat you differently because of your race, because of your gender, because of your age? It can happen. Okay, so it kind of works like this. We call those legal classifications and we break them into three groups. And then there's going to be a different standard of review. Okay, so it's like more difficult for some classifications, less difficult for others. So that's the legal classification. We're going to take the protected classes and break them into three legal classifications. And then there's the standard of review. That's the test that the courts apply to determine if government can legally discriminate against you. Okay, so race is one example of a protected class or religion. The legal classification is suspect. The reason we call it suspect because we assume if there's a law that treats you differently on the basis of your race, we assume that it's unconstitutional. Okay, so the standard of review, the test that courts apply is called the strict scrutiny test. Um, now gender, another legal classification. In this case, it's just quasi-suspect. It might be unconstitutional, it might not be. Okay, we don't assume that it is, but we, we better think, well, government better have a pretty good reason for treating you differently on the basis of your gender. But we apply a different test. It's called the intermediate standard of review. And finally, down here at the bottom, the least protected is age and wealth. Sexual orientation used to be down here. Okay, it was called the non-suspect classification because we assumed that the rule that would treat you differently on the basis of age was constitutional, that the rule that would treat you differently on the basis of wealth, that it was constitutional. Now, recently we've had Supreme Court cases that probably have shifted the position of sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is probably at least quasi-suspect, if not suspect itself. And the history of civil rights, like civil rights struggles, we talk about social movements in the United States, okay? It's really a movement to get your, your legal classification 
to be considered suspect by the courts, to make it more and more difficult for government to treat you differently because of your membership in that group, whether it's race or gender or sexual orientation. Okay, well, going back to the standard of review for non-suspect classifications is the minimum rationality test. You just have to have a, a logical reason to do so, and then it's legal discrimination. All right, so there is one more category here. It's gonna be covered up by my picture. But so the court asks, when the court applies the strict scrutiny test, the question they ask is, is there a compelling state interest? You've seen that question before. When we talked about the Supreme Court case, um, Yoder versus Wisconsin, they had to have a compelling interest and the, usually it was education in that case. A cat just jumped onto my lap here. So maybe he'll be in the camera second. When the court applies the intermediate standard of review, then they, oh, you can't quite see it here. I wonder if I can move it. But they, there has to be a, an important state purpose. Sounds similar, but it's a little bit different than is there a compelling state interest? Just an important state purpose. And finally, down here, the bottom one, the question we ask is, is there a rational basis for the discrimination? So I have some examples for you, starting at the bottom and working our way up. And I have some notes here also that I'll probably have to reference. So the kind of the rust colored one. So we'll start with the non-suspect legal classification. The test is the minimum rationality test. On top, we have an example where the test was applied and it was found to be constitutional, that the discrimination was constitutional. In green on the bottom, the discrimination was found to be unconstitutional. So starting with the court case, Gregory versus Ashcroft. Well, let me just kind of get here. So in Gregory versus Ashcroft, Missouri's constitution required that state judges retire at the age of 70. So Missouri's constitution treated people differently on the basis of their age. And the court found that that was constitutional. They found that there was a, a ra logical, rational reason for the discrimination. So they said with the increased age, there often becomes increased, you know, uh, mental impairments and physical impairments. So having a mandatory retirement age had a rational basis, constitutional. Now in Romer versus Evans, you had a different situation here. So in Romer versus Evans, Colorado voters adopt an amendment to their state constitution that prevented any executive, legislative, and judicial action that would protect LGBTQ from discrimination. So the amendment to the constitution basically mandated unequal treatment for people of, um, a different sexual orientation, okay, than heterosexual. Okay? And the court concluded in that case that there was no government interest, there was no rational basis or otherwise for this amendment to the Constitution. The only reason for the amendment was to mandate unequal treatment and therefore was unconstitutional. It didn't pass the minimum rationality test. All right, going on to the next one. So now we get to the quasi-suspect legal uh, classifications. So these are gonna be about gender and we use the intermediate rationality test, okay? And the intermediate standard of review. So again, on top, you have a case where they upheld the discrimination and on bottom, you have a case where they said, nope, that's unconstitutional. So back in 1981, uh, it was the Carter administration. Uh, well, the case was actually, argued during the Reagan administration. But after the Af uh, Russian invasion of Afghanistan, Jim President Carter had reinstituted the draft. He actually recommended that both men and women be required to um, register for the draft, but uh, Congress disagreed and only required it for men. So some people sued and said that this men only requirement to register for the draft was unconstitutional. And in 1981, the Supreme Court disagreed. And they said this, that when, when applying the question, is there important state purpose to only requiring men to register? The court concluded that yes, there was, 
and they pointed to the combat restrictions on women. So back in 1981, women could not serve in a combat role in the military. Okay. Now, this is fascinating because those combat restrictions don't really exist anymore. Women are, are in combat all the time now. So just last year, there was another court case at the U.S. District Court level where they ruled the male-only requirement for registration is unconstitutional. It has not yet gotten to the Supreme Court, so the precedent is still Rotsker v. Goldberg. Okay. Now, on the one on the bottom here, where they found it unconstitutional, is uh, or versus or. So there was an Alabama law that required men, but never women, to have to pay alimony after divorce. So now alimony is money that the primary income generator pays to address a financial need of the other party when you divorce. Okay, so this was uh, went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled that there was an important government objective in addressing the financial need of the other party. But gender itself was not an indicator of financial need. And so they ruled it unconstitutional. Okay, moving on. So finally, we get to the couple of examples using suspect classification. So when it's most difficult for government to treat you differently. And we apply the strict scrutiny test. So the assumption is that it's unconstitutional. Now, the one on top, when they determine is, again, it's an example where they said this is a this is OK. This is constitutional is that is the case where we actually created the strict scrutiny test in suspect classifications. So the case was Korematsu versus United States and Fred Korematsu. So you probably are familiar with this case. So after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, you know, there was an executive order that. Um, said that we were going to intern Japanese Americans on the West Coast. So Japanese Americans, American citizens, were removed from their homes and their businesses and put in internment camps. Fred Korematsu refused. He stayed in his house, he was arrested, and he was prosecuted. And then he sued and saying that the executive order itself was unconstitutional, a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, no, that it wasn't. They said, one, that race itself, treating people differently on the basis of race, ethnicity, national origin, is a suspect classification. However, in the interest of national security, there was a need to do so. Now, since that time, the United States government has apologized for it for this particular treatment of Japanese Americans and said that it was unconstitutional, should never happen. We still study the case, but because it created that strict scrutiny test that we use, okay? Now on the bottom here is an example where the courts applied the strict scrutiny test. And they're, so they're asking, is there a compelling state interest to treat people differently? In Korematsu versus United States, the compelling state interest was national security. And they said, because of that, we can treat you differently on the basis of your race. On the bottom one, they said there was no compelling reason for school, like there was no compelling reason to treat people differently racially to achieve the purpose of educating children. And in fact, in Brown v. Board of Education, they found that separate but equal is inherently unequal. And to force black children to go to separate facilities uh, embeds in them a sense of inferiority. And so there's unconstitutional, violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And we'll talk more about Brown versus Board of Education later on, probably the second screencast. All right. So the strict scrutiny standard of review, this is the one that we really want to kind of dig into. So like, this is the one that would probably, you'd probably be, if I had, and I do have, it just happens to be in a footlocker in my room at school. If I had a case study involving the 14th Amendment, when can government treat you differently? It would involve um, the suspect legal classification and the strict scrutiny test. So it's reserved for suspect classifications, this particular test. It was ironically created in the Korematsu versus United States court case. 
And there's actually two parts to the test. The first part is that there must be a compelling state interest. There's a second part to the test as well that your tech book, textbook didn't talk about. So it, you have to have a compelling state interest. The second part is that it has to be narrowly, retailed, na narrowly tailored. So let's look at what is a compelling interest. So we know that national security is one example of what could be a compelling interest. Government possibly could treat you differently on the basis of your religion, on the basis of your race, if there's a national security issue at hand. Okay, we learned that in Korematsu versus United States. Government can also treat you differently to remedy past discriminatory conduct. However, it has to be recent past discriminatory conduct. Okay, so this is where we get um, school busing. So when some school districts had to mandate busing and they bus people to different schools to ensure that there was a mixture of different ethnicities and races and income levels in all their buildings, because if they hadn't, there was discrimination that happened within the schools. So you can treat people differently on the basis of race to achieve a remedy for past discriminatory conduct. This, now this third one is kind of up in the air and has been recently added, is that it is also considered a compelling government interest to promote diversity in higher education settings. So not in K-12 setting, but um, in colleges and universities and law schools that, uh, to have a student body that is racially diverse is something that is sought after. And we look at two court cases. One that we will talk about next in the next screencast is Regents of University versus California. Regents of the University of California versus Baki kind of set this standard as a compelling state interest. But then it was reiterated and more recently in Gruder versus Bollinger, which was a court case involving admissions to law schools. Okay, and whether race could be used as a factor in emissions. All right, so the narrowly tailored component gets a little bit tricky. So we have, okay, one, is there a compelling state interest? And we got three examples of compelling state interest. Then we go on to, is it narrowly tailored? And how do we determine if it's narrowly tailored? Well, to be narrowly tailored, the rule, the requirement established by government must have a minimum impact, okay? And they must have actually considered other good faith alternatives, class neutral alternatives. So can you achieve the same thing by looking at income rather than rates? Okay, looking at a, a different legal classification. And um, what about, and then the big one is it has to have a logical stopping point. So once you achieved, you know, what you're trying to achieve, then the requirement must end, okay? So I did have a case study. We're not going to have a case study. I believe that's it for today because next class we want to go back. And on next time I do a screencast, we're going to talk about the history in the fight for civil rights. We're going to look at it through the lens of race and look at, you know, civil rights from that lens. We could look at it through the race of gender, through the lens of sexual orientation as well. But this is the one that we have kind of the most breadth to work with right here. All right, so that's it for today. Just remember that with civil rights, we connect it to popular sovereignty. It's an increase in government power to ensure that everybody's protected under the law. You connect it to the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, and there are two types of discrimination, de jure, de facto. You got three different legal classifications, and then three different tests for when government can treat you differently. The most difficult one is the suspect classification. We assume that if government wants to treat you differently on the basis of religion or race, that's unconstitutional. That if government wants to do so, it has to have a compelling state interest and its remedy must be narrowly tailored. All right, thank you. And um, hoping that's not too much for you all. Okay, let me get back here and all right.